feels like guns come up in the national dialogue most often when there's been some sort of mass shooting. While these events are terrible, they account for a very, very small amount of gun deaths in the United States. Even gun homicide, which is also terrible, isn't the main problem. What is? Suicide. That's the topic of this special episode in this special series on healthcare triage. In 2012, there were 33,363 deaths by firearms in the United States. But only about 12,000 of these deaths were by homicide. About 62% of them by firearms, or more than 20,000 of them, were suicides. Guns are used far more often in suicides than homicides. Research shows that access to guns can make an impulsive suicide attempt far more likely to succeed. People, especially kids, aren't always planning suicide. It's a spur-of-the-moment decision. Let's own that it's not easy to do research on suicide, because you can't, of course, talk to people after the fact. We will also never, ever have randomized controlled trials in this domain, so we're going to have to make do with the limitations of observational research. But you can talk to those who considered it or even attempted it and failed. When studies looked at people who came close to dying from suicide attempts, but lived, about one quarter went from deciding to kill themselves to making the attempt in less than five minutes. Almost three quarters of them took less than an hour. And having access to a gun can make things far worse. Guns work. Suicide attempts with a gun succeed more than 85% of the time. Suicide attempts with poison or overdoses succeed less than 2% of the time. Meta-analyses show that there's a significant association between having access to a firearm and a higher chance of a suicide succeeding. If someone wants to commit suicide, they can find a way even without access to a gun. That's very true. But certainly some could be prevented. Moreover, given the impulsivity of suicide attempts by youth, it's also possible that reducing access of youth to guns, even without restricting the sale and the ownership of guns by legal adults, might make a difference. For example, by increasing safe, locked storage apart from ammunition. There have been many case control studies that show that having a gun in the home is associated with an increased risk of suicide. Depending on the population being studied, the increased risk can be up to 10 times, so it's not a clinically insignificant amount. It doesn't appear that gun attempts are being substituted for non-gun attempts. There's more. The increased risk isn't just for the gun owner. It also applies to the owner's spouse and their children. With respect to adolescents, it's also related to how guns are stored. The presence of a gun at all increases the risk, but if the gun is kept loaded and unlocked, the risk is even higher. Most of these studies are decades old. That's because we've made it hard to do research on guns in this country. But don't get me wrong, it's hard to do research on suicide in general. Let's own, right now, we're not gonna prevent all suicides. Even removing all guns from all homes and making gun ownership impossible will not prevent all those who wanna commit suicide from doing so. This is especially true because many countries have much stricter gun laws in the United States and still have higher rates of suicides in the United States. Japan and South Korea, for instance, have very low rates of gun suicide, but very high rates of suicide in general. Of course, it's entirely possible that their rates of suicide could be even higher if they had easy access to guns, so there's that as well. But let's also accept that we might reduce the number of people who do commit suicide, especially adolescents. That doesn't have to be through major legislation. Some of the work has to come from suicide prevention, obviously. Mental health is a real problem, and too often we don't treat it as seriously as we should. This is an area where we really could focus on education. Programs which focus on gun safety and the need to keep firearms truly well secured and away from kids could make a difference. Because remember, most of those suicide attempts are short-term decisions. People don't decide to commit suicide and then go out and buy a gun so much as they decide to commit suicide and already have a gun handy. Intervention efforts therefore may need to focus on that access in the home more than the access to purchase. What happens in the home is likely much less in the hands of lawmakers and more in the hands of individuals. Getting them to talk about this is key. This is an area where physicians can come into play as well. We've covered in previous episodes how pediatricians as well as other physicians can ask about guns in the home. Regardless of one's personal beliefs about owning guns, it's incumbent upon all of us to be able to talk about the very real and focused matter of safe storage, unfortunately. As we've also covered here at Healthcare Triage, laws have cropped up in recent years to prevent physicians from doing this. 
Calls for privacy have led some to question whether doctors should even be able to ask about guns. Clearly, every patient-doctor relationship is private and individual. But remember this. Physicians are supposed to cover topics that can make patients uncomfortable. It's why what you tell your doctor is confidential. Your privacy, your medical records, and all your privileged information are still protected by the same laws that they have always been. And contrary to what you might hear on talk radio, none of that changed with the Affordable Care Act. There's also this. You have every right to refuse to answer any questions about guns that doctors ask. You can lie. You can even just not come to the doctor in the first place. There's nothing stopping you from preventing us from helping you. But when doctors or anyone else tries to talk to you about guns, it's not always about changing the laws or even really about preventing homicides. They're concerned about kids getting their hands on guns. And they're concerned about suicides. What could we possibly do about all of this? That's the topic of the next episode of Healthcare Triage. <laughs> Healthcare Triage is funded in part by viewers like you through Patreon, a service that allows you to support the show through a monthly donation. Your support makes this show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank Joe Sevitz and Sam. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Sam. More information can be found at patreon.com slash healthcaretriage. 